to message her. Okay, so this morning we're talking about the USDA Rural Development Value Added Producer Grant and uh, uh, why you should care about it and apply for it. My name is Melissa Moeller. I work for NABC as a grant writer, um, but I initially learned about the value added producer grant as a farmer. Back in 2011, I learned about it and uh, thought it would be a really helpful way for me to grow my chicken farm. At that time, I applied for a value added producer grant to make soup stock. So we took what we called retired laying hens and turned them into soup stock, put that into frozen quart containers and sold that in grocery stores. And so that was my very first VAPG grant that I was awarded. That was so successful and helped me out so much that I applied for a second one. The second one was turning chicken manure into bagged compost. Um, and uh, so my my husband said at that time that I'd really made it because I was able to sell people chicken poop and have them pay money for it. Um, again, that one worked out so well for me that I decided to do my third and final VAPG grant application, which was for selling more of my eggs to more people in more places. Um, and that one was the full $250,000 grant. Um, it's along the way in there, I started working with Jeff Voltz at NABC, helping farmers apply for these grants, um, educating them about that, making them available to more farmers. To me, this is the closest thing to free money for farmers that, that is out there. It is an absolutely wonderful program. I have really benefited from it, and I hope to encourage all of you who are farmers to apply for it as well. This morning, we are very uh, blessed to have Carlotta Denisi from USDA Rural Development here to walk us through the VAPG program. And for those of you who aren't familiar with rural development, it is a USDA program that provides funding in rural areas, often in partnership with private sector lenders and community-based organizations. They offer money in the form of loan guarantees, direct loans or grants to individuals, businesses, cooperatives, farmers and ranchers, public bodies, nonprofit corp and nonprofit corporations. So Carlotta is going to focus her discussion on assistance for agricultural producers and ranchers with the Value Added Producer Grant as well as uh, talk to us a little bit about the Renewable Energy Energy for America program. So welcome, Carlotta. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Melissa, for the good introduction about rural development. And um, I'm going to go through the slide deck and, and I'll insert additional information as I go to clarify but there's going to be kind of um sort of a a, a, a melissa's going to come back and talk about some of the same things so you'll be getting it from two angles and just um to warn you it's a lot of information on this grant but it is very doable to people who are first-time grant um, application makers and um so you know don't be overwhelmed by what you hear today. Um, it's a great program. So the purpose of the value added producer grant, which is uh, provided under rural development um, under the umbrella of United States Department of Agriculture is really meant for ag producers, um, uh, farmers and ranchers. And it's for the specific um, reason of helping you to add value to your to your product, to your commodity, um, and realize more revenues for your farm. Um, it expands markets for ag producers and ranchers, and um, you know ultimately strengthens the rural economies. Sorry. So under the um, the grant itself, there's two sections. There's, you can apply for planning grant if you are looking at doing a feasibility study for maybe a project you are not fully um, uh, uh, operating yet with or help with doing a business and marketing plans. And that grant typically has been a $75,000 maximum grant. Um, 
we usually do a lot more activity, uh, at least in our state, with the working capital. And this grant can be for, at, I am presuming it will be the same, but it has been about a $250,000 maximum. And it is for operational expenses for the value added product. And we're gonna go into more detail. Um, the one thing, uh, well, there's a couple things that this, this value added producer grant or VAPG cannot help fund. And that would be um, anything pre-harvest. So no growing costs or pre-harvest um, production. And also um, with the exception of some like computer type equipment, it can't fund processing equipment or other equipment or infrastructure on the farm. Um, it's really meant to bridge that gap between um, you know, your infrastructure being up and ready and getting your product processed and out to market. Um, there is a requirement by the uh, grantee to cover at least 50% of the total project cost. So um, the example here of the 250,000 um, grant, you would also be matching that um, in a diff different methods, which I'll discuss with your matching funds, whether that be cash or in kind, and we'll go into that. So uh, applicant eligibility, um, there are, um, let me see, five different types of applicants. Um, you must be, to meet the agricultural producer definition, um, individual or entity directly engaged in the production of an ag commodity, or that has the legal right to harvest an ag commodity that is subject to the value added project. Um, by directly engaged, um, that means either through a substantially participating in the labor and management and field operations themselves or by maintaining ownership and financial control of the ag operation. Um, yeah, here is the four types of the applicant um, eligible types. And by far, we usually see and fund independent producers. Uh, but there are also ag producer groups, farmer and rancher cooperatives, and less, um, less likely that we see applications from as the majority controlled producer-based businesses. We'll go into that also. Um, so independent producer is an individual ag producer or an entity that's solely owned and controlled by the ag producers. Um, Again, directly engaged in the production of the subject ag commodity um, can either be a sole proprietor, could be a partnership, could be a limited liability company or corporation. Um, and this really does make up, I would say 85 to 90% of our applications are from this type of applica applicant. Um, ag producer group, these are groups that represent and work on behalf of ag producers. I think there's some examples on the screen that show types of associations and that um, requires that the majority of the applicants membership meet that definition of independent producer, which I um, read through a few slides ago. Um, and then also the majority of the board would have to meet that. Um, farmer rancher co-ops, cooperatives. Um, we actually have a number of um, awards that have been made. Here's two examples. And these are um, businesses owned and controlled by ag producers and organized as a cooperative by our state. Um, harvester cooperatives are not eligible. And um, basically that the, the businesses um, that are members of the co-op have to meet that ag producer um, definition. Majority controlled um, producer-based business venture. Um, majority control and financial ownership is independent producers. Um, and we do need to really go through to make sure there's eligibility uh, for this type of applicant because it's a little more um, complicated. slide. Oops, so sorry. 
Um, I wanted to mention something because when um, Melissa was mentioning just rural development in our business programs in general, the word rural came up. Um, and we are rural development. However, if you're an ag producer and you're applying for this value added producer grant, um, you actually could be located in what we consider a, a non rural or ineligible area for our other programs. So um, uh, that would not be a requirement. I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, for um, applicant eligibility. Um, if you're applying for the, the grant and for a project, you must currently produce and provide more than 50% of that commodity that will be used for your value added uh, project. Um, you must own that product, product from um, this raw commodity state through the production of the value added project. So um, your hands are on that um, product the whole time. Um, for value added um, products with multiple ingredients, this is just to point out because it's come up. Let's say I have an example of one that came up more recently. Um, somebody is making um, simple syrups and uh, their ingredient that they're using to meet that 50% or more um, was herbs. So um, they wondered if that just the herb part of their simple syrup was a small, too small of an ingredient as opposed to, you know, sugar and all the other things that have to go into it. And the answer is, um, it, you only have to have one product. Not all your ingredients need to meet that over 50% um, uh, producing and providing. Okay. And here are those applicant types again. Okay. I will talk a little bit more about the product requirements. Um, you need to show value to the commodity in one of five methods, which we will go into. Um, and you need to show that you will increase your customer base. And all this kind of stuff will be talked about as we talk about the actual application and the application template. Uh, but that's an important um, piece of it. And then you will be showing how you will increase revenue um, due to your value added product. Uh, so the five methods to add value, you really, when you apply, uh, the application template gives you a, um, like check mark boxes to check. We really would like you to select one and focus your um, discussion and your justification and all that on one of these. It is a lot easier and it really, you don't get extra points and it is just going to be simpler to select which one fits your type of project. Um, so the uh, first one on this list is change in physical state. We'll have some examples, but basically that would be, let's just say you're turning apples into um, applesauce. Um, and, um, and then go back to that other one. I'll just, uh, I'll just go through those real quick. The enhanced production methods, because I think there are examples coming later. Product segregation, renewable energy. Uh, we really, we prefer, unless these are real large projects, not, not to use that. We'd rather use our Renewable Energy for America program, which I can talk about at the end. And then um, the fifth one, which is uh, number one and number five on this list are actually the most common. So locally produced. So let's say you were taking your uh, product to market and you really were marketing it as locally produced, like in a certain region or a valley or, or so, so anywhere, even state, even within the state or within 400 miles um, constitutes local. So um, I would say physical change in state and the locally produces is our most used um, method. And again, just pick one, even if you're doing two, pick the one that you feel you can uh, um, support and discuss the best. Okay, I'm just gonna change my blinds here, hold on. Sorry about that. In Olympia, we got some sunshine all of a sudden. Okay, um, 
so again, the physical change, um, that would be anything of these examples, like, you know, taking your milk and turning it into cheese, or even wool and turning it into clothing, um, livestock into packaged meat. So those, go ahead. Somebody may have to go on mute and then go ahead, Melissa. There's some pictures there. Yeah. Um, enhanced production. Um, this would be, a, you know, a real good um, example is when uh, people are selling organic or free range, free range, um, you know, chicken eggs, something like that. So it's a recognized set of production practices when growing your commodity and um, you would have a different market for your um, resulting product. So, you know, typically we, we all pretty much know these days that a lot of people want to pay more for organic um, and or free range and any of those, um, you know, different examples of enhanced production. Okay. Um, product segregation, uh, commodity is separated from other varieties um, on the same farm. So that would be separating the production to processing. So an example of um, GMO products and non-GMO. And I would say I don't have much experience with this one. I understand it, but it's not, it's not a, a method that's usually selected, at least in our state. Um, again, renewable energy, um, it can be used um, for value add, it's usually more related to some of those examples on the bottom for the larger grants. If you're talking about doing solar or energy efficiency stuff, I would go to our REAP program. Okay, go ahead. And then again, back to locally produced. Um, so this is if you are um, producing and marketing and distributing um, your value added uh, food product within 400 miles um, of your, let's say your farm or um, just within the state. And then you still would have to show um, increase in revenues versus normal sales method that wasn't, um, that didn't have, you know, the quote local uh, around it. Okay, next. Um, so back to the product requirements as a little recap is you're gonna show a value added to your commodity. You have to pick one of the methods that we just went through and show increase in customer base and show an increase in revenue um, uh, for your value added product. Okay, um, this is kind of a repeat slide for some of the grant amounts and types. All right, so um, down a little bit more into the nitty gritty as far as the eligible expenses for, for working capital. Um, you know, I'll repeat again, uh, you know, there's, it, it's not allowed for infrastructure, buildings, or equipment, or uh, uh, growing. Um, it's basically post harvest. And I forget the wording for is if you have livestock, but um, I think it's to the point of at the slaughter point. So, um, so any processing costs that include labor, it could include utilities um, that's related to your processing for your product. Um, uh, the ingredients, you may have to, um, you know, purchase additional agreements, uh, excuse me, ingredients, uh, packaging, labeling, um, advertising, promoting your project, uh, accounting costs, bookkeeping costs, uh, web development, um, distribution, um, shipping and delivery. So there's a wide range of things that can be um, covered in costs. Um, I, back to the web development, I would just caution that it isn't, because this is the working capital part is not meant to pay for um, pre-design of a website or pre-design of labels and things like that. Some of those things should be 
um, in place, but putting those things in place could be um, eligible expenses. And Carlotta, the other one on there is being able to purchase additional raw commodity. I just wanted to point that out um, that, you know, you only have to grow 51% of the apples and then you can buy the other 49%. Yes, thanks for the clarification. Um, and I kind of talked about some of these ineligible expenses. Um, they're just not eligible, so. Um, I talked a little bit in the beginning about the grantees uh, matching requirements. This is what you would set forth when you make, make the application. Um, at this time, it may change. We do not have the federal register that has that announces the program. There's always a chance that um, the matching funds may, may require less. Um, up to this point, we don't know anything about that for sure, but it could happen. Um, but uh, let's just go based on what we know. It's going to be 50% of the total project cost. So half grant, half your input of uh, funds. Um, you must spend um, uh, grants and matching funds on eligible expenses. Um, and it must be spent in advance of grant draw requests, which just means this is a reimbursement grant. So as you're set up to do your working capital project, um, for instance, you're, you're not getting advance on your grant funds. You're spending your own money and then you're getting reimbursed. Um, there should be no conflict of interest with matching funds. So um, that would, it, there's a few things, but mostly it's related to uh, close family um, and how that um, close family cannot be paid or if you, you have a contract with someone, they should not be a close family that owns a business that you want to contract with, that kind of a thing. And on a case by case, of course, we're always available to, to kind of go over those kind of uh, details. Um, and then through your application is many places that you will be verifying this type of information. And then we confirm it at an award if you're selected. Let's move on. Um, so the eligible sources of the matching funds can be cash. Um, yeah, as far as paperwork goes and, and our end, cash is easiest. Um, but, uh, you know, also you can, but it, it no longer garners higher scoring. So you're not, um, it's not necessarily required. Uh, you could have a loan that uh, can go towards your matching funds. You can also use the value of your raw ag commodity, which is pretty big. So, um, so people that are trying to get in with, uh, let's say, very little, maybe even no cash, um, you know, you can use these other methods to get up to your 50% match. And number three is you can match with in-kind labor of yourself and family members. Um, but at the bottom, you can only count up to 25% of the total project costs for that applicant or family in-kind labor. <clears throat> and then there can be third party cash. So let's say you have um, a third party that wants to, you know, assist you that can be verified and used and third party in kind. So in some cases, there's been nonprofit organizations and different things like that that will participate in some type of in kind contribution towards that total matching requirement. Um, all right, I, I, there's, you know, there, it is confusing because there's a lot of different benchmarks for things. And so um, I know everybody will probably have questions and uh, um, we, we are very open to getting phone calls and emails to clarify some of this stuff. So under the application types, <clears throat> um, under working capital, uh, there's simplified application, um, 
which is a misnomer because it's still not really simple, <laughs> but it's really a dollar benchmark, which we'll talk about. And then market expansion applications and then emerging market applications. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so simplified applications are those applications that require that are going to be less than a fifty thousand um, dollar grant request. So let's say you're going to. I'm just going to say forty thousand, but you can go all the way to forty nine thousand nine hundred and fifty if you want. But uh, if your your grant request, let's say, is forty thousand, then your total project cost would be eighty thousand on this um, simplified. Um, all applicant types that I um, mentioned before are eligible for a simplified application. Um, under this, this is where, and we'll talk about this again, but a feasibility study, like a third party prepared feasibility study um, and our business plan is not required under a simplified. However, I would note here that we really need in the application template, it calls for some of this information that discusses uh, feasibility about your product and and the market and the and your business planning. Um, so, but uh, not completed by a third party. So that's the um, one of the the benefits to this uh, simplified application. Uh, you still do have to show your customer base expansion and revenue increases. Okay. Um, okay, emerging markets. So this is if your project is going to be over 50,000 up to the max, which we believe right now is still 250,000. Um, and this would be for if you're already producing and marketing a value-added product, but it's been less than two years. So there is the the emerging, you're still emerging into the market, um, less than two years. So all applicant types are eligible for this and you would need an independent feasibility study and business plan required with this um, emerging market, you know, size of application. And, uh, and we do a lot of um, uh, clarification on this after. So really contacting us is, is key. Go ahead. And then a market expansion. So again, the same dollar range for the grant, but this because you're expanding a product that you're already producing for over two years, or at it's, it's actually says at least two years. So the benchmark is that two year under for emerging and at least two and plus for expansion. And again, all uh, no, excuse me, only independent producers are eligible applicant type for expansion. Um, took me years to get that straight, so <laughs> don't feel bad about uh, um, reconfirming that. Um, and again, business and marketing plan is required, um, but a feasibility by a third party is not required under market expansion uh, for a product you've been doing at least two years. Um, the application content, um, this is going to be real brief. Um, I think uh, Melissa is going to cover some, some things later in her portion, but please know that we have very detailed application templates that are made available to applicants, and it really does spell out exactly what we're looking for in, in these things here, like the work plan and budget. Um, which is a pretty detailed uh, outlay of information that you have to provide. So you're going to be giving a narrative, your project, your goals, your tasks in detail, your budgets that are going to be uh, split up into different categories, such as, let's say, labor processing. Um, and then there'll be marketing possibly, and there, there's different categories that you'll select. And it'll be pretty detailed. You're gonna identify who the key uh, personnel is gonna be that's responsible for those tasks, whether it's you as the owner or other paid um, staff. You're gonna have detailed timeframes for each task as well as the entire project. 
And then um, it also gives a spot to show what um, the source of the income is. So if you're using grant funds for this or that, or a mixture of that and matching funds, um, the, there's you know a detailed table that's already in the application template. So you really are not starting from scratch. You really have a place to put all of this information. And of course, we do have some federal forms um, that will go along with the application template. So don't wait to the last minute and submit the template without the actual federal application for federal assistance and a couple other forms. Okay. Uh, grant period is anywhere from one to three years and for working capital. Um, we, we almost always see two to three, which is the maximum. Um, if you go for two and somehow your um, project needed extending, you can still um, extend, but no more than the three-year maximum from the date that we issue a grant agreement. Um, the application does have to be complete. And this is where we do offer our um, assistance at rural development by talking with you ahead of time. So if you're um, maybe a little confused, or you're not sure you have enough info, or you're not sure you're covering everything, you can talk to us about it and then also send us your draft and we can kind of go through it. And we can't promise you that our review is going to <laughs> um, for sure make it um, eligible and complete or score the best, but it will give you a better chance. We, we almost always find things that we feel that would be, um, um, you know, improvement for you. So definitely take advantage of our staff as well as NABC and Melissa will talk about that. Um, uh, Melissa mentioned that she's had multiple grants. So the key to that, and I think she'll talk about that later too, is that um, from year to year, if you, or, or period to period, whichever your application is for, you may have the same product, but if you're changing the, um, the, the like, let's say you're going from uh, marketing as a local, and you're maybe five years later you do it or three years later you do it and you're gonna market it as organic or free range. And I'll just use eggs as, as that example. And I, I think I hit the mark on that. Don't you think, Melissa? Um, I thought it had to be a completely different value added product, but you are the expert, not me. So that's interesting to me. Okay, well, I might have to circle back on that one. Um, it's like mine right. was a chicken um, uh, broth and then compost and then eggs. And I've worked with other farmers where say they do kale chips one year and then bean soup the next year. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a mix between what we're both saying. And so I would like if, if, if that happens to be the case for anybody, I would say, let's just get uh, in contact with me right up front and I'll make sure. Um, Again, even after years of doing these, uh, some of these things can be confusing. So, uh, but you can only have one uh, active grant at one time. So let's say you have one now you're finishing out. Um, it has to be finished before we would get to the point of awarding a new one, not at application time, but at, um, at uh, awarding time. Okay, go ahead. If, if I could just interject on this one, um, I do really like to see people write a two-year rather than a three-year application, simply because um, if you do a two-year and you don't meet your goals and don't spend all the money and time, you can extend that and add an extra couple of months or up to a year. But if your original plan calls for a full 36 months and you know, farming happens, you aren't producing as much as you had expected. Once you get to that 36th month, the money's gone. You, you don't get to access it anymore. So I encourage people to do that two-year grant. And also our rural development staff is really amazing in Washington state. They have been incredibly responsive. I like to encourage people to turn in an application a month, if you can, before the deadline so that they can grade your paper. Right. And you take all the information that they give you and you incorporate that in and you're going to score much higher than if you just turn it in at the last minute. Absolutely. 
Okay, so here's just a little visual of the um, project timeline, a few other things. Um, you're assembling your application. You're submitting it to us. Again, um, a pre-review on our part is recommended. Um, and then you're submitting it by the deadline, which again, the Federal Register has not been um, announced yet. Uh, we're hoping in January, and that should give you at least 60 days to put it together once it's announced, but you can be working on it. And Melissa's talk, going to talk about that. And then once uh, the deadline comes, we have all our applications. Our part here at Rural Development in our state is to look them through for completeness um, and, and eligibility. And then we um, score them in our state. Um, uh, and then what happens is we uh, they are submitted to our national office and they are sort of um, distributed out to independent third party reviewers and and scored again at a national level level and it competes all your your project competes nationally um, and then uh, if you are awarded the grant then the um, you know project initiation uh, would come into um, play and then we would of course do a grant agreement, re-verify some matching funds, talk about the reimbursement process, which I mentioned before is um, is a reimbursement process. So you're you know you're putting out your money, your work first, and then requesting a reimbursement. And there's a detailed process on that. Um, and again, we do offer really um, hands-on helping hands assistance for um, that first reimbursement or two can be pretty uh, hair pulling. <laughs> but after you get the hang of it with some of our tools, um, I would say anybody would agree that it, it moves along much nicer. Now, there is reporting that's required on a semi-annual basis. Of course, we have a, a federal form that you fill in numbers on you know, what you've expended and different things like that, and a narrative. And then at the uh, final end, there is a more of a detailed final reporting to show how you've met uh, your revenue um, goals and maybe job increase goals and customer increase goals, things like that. Um, but again, um, you know, it's uh, it's it is required. And I think the grant funds is worth the extra pain of having to do the reporting part and, and we'll always help you out. And then just to throw in there that the grant portion that you receive um, <laughs> is subject to um, some kind of uh, tax liability and you'll receive a, a 1099 for that after all your grant funds are expended. Yeah, and if I could just interject here again, um, it's not too early to start assembling your application. The, uh, the, it doesn't change very much year to year. So what I like to encourage people to do is take last year's template and start filling it out. Get as much done as you can ahead of time. Do a marketing plan. Um, get all of your ducks in a row so that when they announce it, you're ready to begin submitting it. Um, we have seen the it come available anytime between December and March. And with the window, if any time between 60 days and 90 to 120 days. So it's definitely not too early to get started in terms of thinking about when to start your budget, October 1st, regardless of when the application comes open and when the application is due, um, USDA takes the summer to go over those all, all of those applications and awards the money August to September. And then October 1st is the beginning of the fiscal year when you can start expending the money. Thank you. And that said, um, uh, on our national website, um, there is a page that, that uh, does provide um, the application template, which it is last year. So if you're going to use it as a, to get started in the narrative portion of it, you can do that. I would just say, um, you know, you'll, you will have to do the new one that they post, but um, we can send out that link so you can take a look at what that process looks like. And I just saw that question pop up. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. And, and later on in the presentation, I am going to show you the uh, the template and where to find it, but we'll also send out links to everyone after the meeting. 
Right. And, um, and then to go back to getting help from RD, Rural Development, um, we have a number of people on the west side of Olympia. We have, a, I think, four or five of us. So we have a couple up in Mount Vernon and we have three of us here in Olympia. And then on the east side, um, we have Yakima and Wenatchee. Uh, we have three, three people over there that can assist, and that's usually what we do. So if you end up contacting me and it's over in Yakima, I would definitely recommend you talk to Ronnie and get you hooked up with her, and, and the same for the West Side. So um, just know that we actually have quite a few hands on our deck to uh, help you out, take your call, and um, you know provide you the tools and such. You mean you read that? I was going to read my pen. You know, there's that in there too. Somebody needs to mute. And what? Yeah, don't. I'll... There we go. Oh, I'm still going. Okay. For <laughs> some reason, I thought I was done. Okay. Um, so, in so I kind of alluded to scoring. That's a big part of this application. So, you, you know, when you go through the application, you're going to make sure you're thorough. However, on our end, when we score it, we're looking at all of these sections in that application and scoring it based on some, some measurements and how thorough you are. So the first one, the nature of the project, I believe that's the highest um, section worth 30 points. So you could, you know, score 30 um, as long as you're addressing everything in detail. So you would be, you know, discussing things as if um, the person reading it has no clue, you know, what your farm is or what you're producing or even how you're growing or, or um, producing whatever your product is. So you're, you're addressing your technical feasibility, which means, you know, um, your your farming operation, your own equipment, um, all of those things that will make it technically feasible, operational efficiency, you know, you have the staff, the ability, the experience and all of that of, for operational efficiency, profitability, you'll be talking about um, historical um, numbers, revenue, uh, financials, and what your profitability is and projected and sustainability. So that one's pretty detailed and it's that's probably why it's worth 30 points. So you'll want to um, make sure to um, really put a lot of effort into that. And I know Melissa is going to talk more about that. And it, um, it addresses qualifications of the personnel. One um, mistake that can be a big one um, for this section is some people are still assuming that well, they don't have to discuss the maybe the exact qualifications of who's doing what, even if it's a processing position. Um, that is important. And there are, you know, the, sc the scaling of our scoring, you don't want to get five points for just mentioning it rather than getting the full points for describing why you're a certain person and that person's name are qualified to do what they're doing. So, um, you want to you want to have detail even there, even if you think it's uh, um, you know obvious. Um, treat it as if it's not obvious. Um, and then number three, commitments and support. Um, Melissa can talk more about this, but this is where you're going to talk about what your matching funds are, whether it's um, cash match um, and other uh, commitment from end users. So. Those would be, let's say your bookkeeper, your bookkeeper would write a letter and say, yep, I'm on board. I'm going to be ready and available for two years for this project or whatever it is. And also suppliers um, and also um, uh, buyers, possibly you may have some uh, stores or online uh, companies or whatever that may have expressed interest or even, well, it's always good to have some kind of a contract or something in writing, but usually it'll be more of a, a letter of uh, interest or that kind of thing, or maybe from a store or online that's already purchasing, those kind of things. Don't skip those. Um, 
and then the work plan and budget I kind of talked about in previous um, slide, uh, the detail that goes into that. And then priority points, you're going to be selecting if you're applying um, for priority points under a beginning farmer rancher, which is um, less than 10 years of farming. Um, and then uh, socially disadvantaged. Um, typically this would have been wording we would have used as a minority or woman known in the past. Probably not supposed to say that we're supposed to just use socially disadvantaged and that's a certification. Um, no other type of proof other than a certification or veteran status. So those are all things that are boxes to tick off in the application template. So um, not to worry, you don't have to remember all of this. And then the last one there is small or medium family farm. Oh, thank you. It was kind of cut off my screen. Thanks right for up. adding that. Yeah. And then those have some specific revenue based um, numbers too. So it's small as under a million dollars in average revenue over the last three years. Thank um, you. So most people are eligible for priority points in some way or the other. We really work hard to, to find one of those boxes. The toolkit that USDA provides goes through all of this in incredible detail. If you just fill out that toolkit, following the examples that they give, use their words. They have thought really hard about what words they want to see. So don't reinvent the wheel. Just go through the toolkit and give them the exact information that they ask for in each section. And I also encourage people to not assume assume that the, you know, it's like, well, I've said this before. I said this back on page two, and now you're telling me to say it on page 10. I'm like, yep, say it again on page 10. Assume page 10 is only being read by one person and page two was read by somebody else. You want to make sure that you fill out every single thing that they're asking for in order to get the maximum points. Very good. Oh, now it's time for questions for Carlotta. So Emily, if you could first go through the questions that came up in chat and um, call on people to ask those questions, I would appreciate that. Absolutely, I can just read them off. I have been tracking them. Um, so I'll do it by, there were quite a few, so I'll do it kind of by category. Okay. Um, Eligibility. So for the first, for eligibility class uh, questions, we have Daniel asked, are unincorporated associations with a fiscal sponsor able to apply? Um, I, okay. So the applicant does have to be an ag producer under the definition of ag um, producer, which I can read off that definition and that might answer that. Um, someone who produces an ag commodity through participation in day-to-day -day labor, management, and field operations. An absentee owner would be unable to participate in day-to-day -day labor. So I'm not sure. It, it kind of sounded like the answer would be no, but I just wanted to make that statement there. Well, I, I, I guess uh, I... I would interject here that in many grants, you need to be a nonprofit. And so you need to have a fiscal sponsor. If you're not a nonprofit, this is not one of those grants. This is a grant for for-profit farmers, for people who are agricultural producers. And so, um, yeah, they, they would be the ones who are eligible. Okay, yeah, I think we yeah. got that covered. Thank you, yeah, Daniel. Answered it. Okay, great. And then that was another question was, are nonprofits eligible to apply? So the answer is no. No. Right. Um, and then, which I, I thought so, but good to know. Okay. <laughs> um, do you need a certain amount of farming experience or Schedule F filings to be, Ashe asked, to be eligible for this grant? Um, you do need to demonstrate that you that you can meet the definition, which basically requires you to have been farming. Um, I, I don't know that it's specified anywhere as far as like one year or to prove you have that tax, you would have to maybe prove it if you're going for beginning farmer and you're new. Um, so I, you know, I, we don't have it specifically outlined. Yeah, I would, I would say for the emerging market application, you really don't, but you're not, you're gonna have a hard time 
filling out the application and scoring well if you don't have experience as a farmer. You're not going to be getting sure. priority points. You're not going to have uh, sales history. And to do the emerging market application, you need to go pay someone outside of yourself, outside of your organization to uh, produce a feasibility study for you. So it's possible, but it's a lot harder than if you grow your farm organically for a couple of years and then apply for an emerging, uh, I'm sorry, a market expansion grant. Okay, should, great. Be, should be farming for at least a year to show that you're, um, you know, that you're already farming. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Marion wanted to know, are producers who plan to use a shared commercial kitchen eligible to apply? Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the, the funds to pay for that uh, shared commercial kitchen space would be an eligible expense. Okay, great. The expense is not the equipment though. Correct. Yeah. Right. It would probably almost be easier even to pay for that than to pay for new equipment. So that totally makes sense. Okay, great. Um, Warren Neff wanted to, well, let's wait for that one because that's more of a follow up and we'll I'll wait for the end. Um, for accessibility, Daniel wanted to know, um, does the raw agriculture match is, is nice. Does the USDA have any other strategies or resources to offer for smaller starting businesses that do not have cash reserves available to pay for project costs up front, i.e. a piece of equipment that requires a large down payment? Um, no, not really. I mean, there are other resources um, that sometimes, well, I mean, I can't speak for TILF, but I have heard in the past that um, from a number of um, farmers that have received grants, um, so I don't know how ongoing that goes, but for for flexible reasons. So maybe uh, looking at the TILF website would be helpful. And then also, you know, emailing me, you know, on the side or later, um, I can kind of dig through some of my contacts and things like that too sometimes, so. Well, Washington State has had some infrastructure grants, uh, particularly in the last year, year and a half. So I would say be looking for those. Um, everybody always wants equipment, right? I mean, that that is the huge need for farming is equipment more than anything. However, I would say while this grant does not cover equipment, it covers expenses that you already have if you're selling your product. So for me, I was selling eggs in a carton. And so the cartons were covered, the labor for washing the eggs, cartoning the eggs, distributing the eggs. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars of expenses were covered. I couldn't apply to get a new barn, but what I did was I applied for $250,000 worth of eligible expenses, expenses I already had. And then I was reimbursed that $250,000. And guess what I did? I built a $100,000 barn with it for with part of it. So, you know, if, if you look at this in a creative way, and you say, these are the things that they want to fund, this is how they want to help you grow your farming business, take it to the next level, bring your product to more people, bring more money back to the family farm, then as you grow, you will be able to get reimbursed for those expenses you already have and buy the things that you want. Sure, great. Um, and then Daniel also wanted to know if there are any recommendations for where to find low cost feasibility studies tailored to egg producers. Uh, so I, I, I will say I know of a few just from uh, their past applications. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say low cost because I, I don't have the ability to do that, but I would say reach out separately and we can talk about some feasibility study consultants that have provided in the past and then again to NABC answer that. Yeah, NABC does do feasibility studies for agricultural producers. I couldn't speak to the exact cost just off the top of my head. Um, that would be something that we would need to to look at together in terms of the scope and how much work it would be to produce that feasibility study. Yeah, and we'll put together um, with the Q and A uh, like the answers to these, and then also resources like links to resources. Excellent. So these these can be kind of ongoing. Um, 
Okay, and then so for process and like project el eligibility questions, um, Marion wanted to know, and I feel like you kind of answered this, Melissa, so I need to get too deep into it, but any idea how far in advance applicants should start preparing their application? Right now, start right now, yeah. Start, start as soon as you have your idea in mind, start by making a marketing plan that uh, you know, kind of goes through what have you done in the past? What will you do in the future? We're going to talk more about that a little bit later here in terms of the kind of questions that you need to be answering in your marketing plan. But I would say everyone should have, even if you're applying for the simplified application, do a simple business and marketing plan for your product. That's great. Okay, and then Isaac wanted to know, um, can we start our project before and or while the grant is approved and implemented? You can, but you won't be reimbursed for it. You can, you nobody's gonna stop you from doing anything you want with your farming, but if you want the USD fund, USDA funding, you need to delay any expenses to October 1st of 2023. Great. Um, and then Isaac also wanted to know, when it comes to matching, does investment in equipment and infrastructure count as matching? For, no, for example, not. okay, no, so it, it, not. okay. But with, with most applications that I've worked on, even ones where people are fairly beginning farmers, it's pretty easy to get to that 50% match with your family's labor. So anyone who is a family member, they can contribute <coughs> labor for free as your match. And then the rest of it we do, actually we start with the commodity. How much is your commodity worth before you've added value to it? So for example, in my case for eggs, I figured out, well, what would the eggs be worth if I didn't sell them as pasture raised and organic? And that was my commodity contribution to the project, right? I didn't have to have any cash at all. I used the commodity and then any, any uh, match that we need in addition, we do labor. So it's very rare anymore. Uh, at least on the applications that I've worked on, for people to have to come up with cash alone or third-party contributions. Great. Um, and uh, Ashe was wondering about, how about funds? Would funds that are used to pay for employees working in a commercial kitchen, like hiring a chef to help with recipe development considered eligible? Um, for recipe development, no, for, um, for, uh, paying, uh, personnel to do processing and that kind of thing. Um, yes, those are eligible project costs, uh, but recipe development, that would be in planning. So, you know, we're se seemingly talking a lot about the working capital type grant. So, uh, we have to remember that there is a planning type. And so planning type things cannot be eligible in a working capital uh, application. Sure, okay. And then um, finally we have some, well, Larry wanted to know kind of on that same vein, um, what are specific experiences and qualifications necessary for feasibility study consultants? Um, well, again, in our if we go to our regulation, it doesn't it doesn't specify it in detail. So generally, we hope to see um, that the consultant has been doing this. You know, you would you uh, like Larry. Let's say you were going to talk to one. You would be saying, "What is your experience? What's your history? Maybe what other." Um, businesses or whoever have you you know assisted that kind of thing you're doing some due diligence that should pass your muster um before we would say it doesn't you know normally we would not be getting into the into the business of saying who would not be eligible but i mean some i i do remember seeing maybe one or two in the past it was like oh this is questionable whether this is really a qualified third party. So I'm sorry I didn't really answer it, but hopefully it gave you something to think about. And then as a side note, if you get down to it, you know, get right with us and we can we can talk about it in more detail. 
Uh, thank you, Carlotta. I really appreciate your time on this. I wanted to, just in the interest of time, make sure we reserve some time for you to talk about the REAP program. Yes, we're very close to the end. Um, and the last few questions should be pretty quick. Um, Larry wanted to know if we can have the slideshow without the audio. Yes. If, I figured the answer was yes. And then um, he also wanted to know if you'll provide a table with scoring points and like in criteria number. So that would yes. be the, the toolkit. Oh, but if, yeah, if you have one, that's awesome. Okay, great. We, we and then have more time for questions later too. Okay, great, great. Well, I, I think I can make a note of them and we'll make sure to send out if your question was unanswered, we can, we'll answer it later and send it out. Okay. So yeah, I'll just say a couple uh, things about our Renewable Energy for America program, REAP. Um, and that is a program that would help um, farmers and ranchers to either conduct energy efficiency improvements to their farm. And it's also for uh, non-ag um, producers too, it could be um, a business enterprises, non-ag um, related, um, and also for renewable energy. So for in our state, we've done, we do the energy efficiency thing that covers lights and um, heating and things like that, that that reduces the energy used by the farm or the business. Um, but by far, we've done solar installations. So, um, and Larry that's on here, I know he's received um, a solar under our REAP program. I think he's still pretty happy with it. Um, and so with that program, the grant covers 25% of the eligible project costs. Um, and so that's still pretty good. And um, that uh, the next deadline for that application is March 31st. Um, and there's a process for that also, but it's not nearly as complicated, um, labor intensive and that kind of thing to qualify. In fact, we have uh, partners that um, are available to assist with questions and feasibility of that project that you'd wanna do under REAP for free assistance um, and, uh, you know, contact me if you have any questions on that. Any questions for Carlotta on the REAP program while we have her here? It's Larry, I just have a comment, but the only thing that was a surprise to me was the requirement for a civil, a professional structural engineer assessment is on pretty much anywhere you're going to put it, whether it's the ground or a roof, and many ag buildings are, are, not, are, are going to have some problems there. Mine didn't, but just kind of be aware of that, that that expense would not be covered. The the structural assessment that you, they can like, say you can put panel, solar panels on or a roof, you have to have an asset. Obviously they want to make sure it's going to be structurally sound. So just. Yeah, and typically but, that's not necessarily required from our program, but it, if you if you have a, a, a good trustworthy contractors um, installer, they're going to be saying, "Hey, uh, we don't want to put yeah, their insurance our equipment yeah. on there." Yeah, yeah. Their, their insurance required it anyway. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, but it's a good point. Thanks. Okay. Any more questions for Carlotta? I, I we have we have a few more minutes before it's time for our break. Yeah, I have uh, two quick questions. Go ahead. Um, so uh, one of the things that I was really looking into this grant for is like label enhancement for the products that I have. Um, and I know you said that like pre-design of labels is not eligible, but I'm looking to um, hire an artist for like illustrations and print them in color and get all the printing and stuff done. Are those eligible expenses? Yes, they are. So there is a fine line. So we want to, when, when you're putting that together, you maybe want to talk to myself or, or Melissa or one of our other staff. Uh, just we, there's a fine line between planning and, but for what, how you described it, yes, that is eligible. And I'll just throw in there that even though equipment uh, by and large is not eligible, there, there are pieces of equipment that would qualify as eligible if they're under um, $5,000 in value. So like a label maker, printer, software, different things like that. 
um, can be eligible expenses also. So you would okay. want to keep that in mind. Okay. And then my other question was for the, the in-kind labor for the matching funds. Does that need to be like a paid wage labor or would like unpaid labor as a compensation be eligible? So in-kind um, labor for yourself, you have to value it. So, you know, you can go to some different resources that say, uh, you know, processing is, you know, whatever, 20, $25 an hour. And then you would value your time for your in-kind work or your family, your husband or whoever. Um, and so that, does that answer it? So you're going to value it. But you're not yeah, paying you, yourself. Yeah, you don't, you don't necessarily have to pay yourself that. Yeah, that you're not paying yourself and the grant's not paying you, but you have to value it to, you know, get those dollar amounts to make that 50% match of the whole total project cost, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's it. great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Because most farmers so drastically underestimate their value. What I say is go to a source like indeed.com or salary.com and say, what does a business manager get paid in my area and value your time that way? And say, you know, a, a business manager manager in my area gets paid $32 an hour, and I'm going to contribute so many hours by doing these things. Or if you're paying somebody to do processing, you're going to be doing the processing yourself. You can say, well, that is what it's worth, you know, including the hourly wage plus the um, taxes that I would have had to pay that person. That is what my time is worth. Great. Thank you so much. Well, let's go ahead and take a, a 10 minute break and then we will come back and have, uh, hopefully we'll have a farmer panel. You know, farmers are very busy people who have emergencies happen. So I'm uh, hoping my farmer panel will show up. If not, uh, we will move on into my presentation. So we will come back at, uh, let's say 1020. So an eight minute break. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa or Carlotta or somebody, is anybody able to clarify what's meant by the uh, pre-designed for, for, the, for the label portion? Um, okay, I'm on here. Hold on. Let me look in. I have uh, some cheat notes. Let me find it. And and again, I just to make sure, you know, you can always email me to sometimes being put on the spot is... <laughs> but I do have this one marked. Hold on a minute. I'm happy to follow up on email. That's preferable. It's no problem. Okay. And I am making note of all these, and I plan to type out answers as best I can based on these answers or asking Melissa or, um, or Carlotta. So th these will all get answered after the fact, if not today. Okay, okay that so would time. probably that would probably be the best. Sure. I've totally. Yeah. A... Take take your break, please. Sorry. Thank you. I do need <laughs> we'll to do that. Thank you. All
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope you're all back from your break. Um, I am super excited to get to introduce you to two of my fam fa favorite farmers. Um, I've got uh, Dorcas Young here from La City Farm, and she has already received two value-added grants that she's going to talk about. And then Amy Fry from Boldly Grown Farm uh, won a grant just this last cycle. And both of them and have them share their experiences with you. Um, so first of all, Dorcas, what value-added products did you receive grants for? Oh, uh, Dorcas is muted. Um, Emily, can you unmute her? Yes. Thank you. If you could unmute Dorcas and Amy Fry. I see. Dorcas looks like she's unmuted. And now Amy is too. Great. They they should both be unmuted unless they're calling in with audio and I don't see that. Okay, Dorcas. Oh, no, we can't hear you, Dorcas. There's something wrong with your audio. Um, Emily, do you think- Can you hear me? Ah, no, we can can't. You? There you are. Welcome, welcome. So good to see you. I think it's a, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Seems like it's, it's echoing. We don't hear the echo. Yeah, it's echoing. Let me see why. Oh, no. Okay. Um, it's an echo. I think that's just okay. for you, but we're, we're good. So go ahead and tell us about your, do you have two value-added grants that you've won? Tell us what they were each for. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you just fine. Oh, okay, okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I wanna thank you, Melissa, for for letting me to become in this panel. Uh, my name is Dorcas Young, and I am a farm owner and a founder of Lesedi Farm LLC. Um, my, my project started about 2007, you know, as a farm. I moved here and I started to farm, grow things, and then I took a lot of classes through NABC uh, to see what I can do 
to enhance my business or my adventure because I was a stay home mom, you know, and then food was one of the things that was necessary to bring to the table to help my husband who was working as a teacher and me being at home. So I leased the land. I started as a pea patch and I see the land, I grow some vegetables and then I started to grow kale and beans all along. And I took a lot of classes through Health Alliance and anything that NBC was putting up there, I was always online to take it. I didn't know how it's gonna turn out, but it's one of those things that I was just doing, taking it, taking it, taking it. And it helped me in, I think it was 2016, and Jeff Volz and Melissa Mola, they had a class and it was in Mount Vernon. So they sent it to farmers in Whitby Island and said, well, I signed up for that course. It was a VAPG, value added. And then I decided, well, I'm gonna take this even though I don't know what it is. But it seems like it talks about, you know, vegetables, something I grew up in the village, drying things. Now it seems like a new technology. Then I went to the class and then I was able to, um, to learn how to change state of certain products so that you can sell it later. And another thing was, you know, as a farmer, you tend to grow things, but there's always a waste in the middle. So therefore that was this thing that I was looking at to try to eliminate a lot of waste and then to look at, okay, if the vegetable season is done, what am I gonna do? So I do a lot of class of, you know, raw material change of state, a lot of things in that particular class. And I didn't leave, I just stayed and they said, well, we have a program we're gonna ask those that are interested to come and sign up for this class so that they can, um, they can get a training. And I signed up, I don't know, Melissa, she can correct me this. I think there was 15 of us in the class when we started in 2016. Um, I think it was end of 2015 to 16, and I applied for that grant. Man, I had no money. I'm telling you, I had nothing. And I was like, well, I have to go look for a job or something. But you know, that $50,000 that I got, my first account was such a blessing. I work hard on it. And I had no knowledge how to write a grant or anything like that. But because they have a, a group there, they were training us, putting this package together and understanding a lot of things to put the package together. And I stayed on the course and I was able to get granted that in uh, for my kale chips products. And that was the time when the, the kale chips was in the big market. And I formulated and I started to sell mine at the farmer's market because I was selling it before I did the grant. But it wasn't really, I didn't have money to buy certain things, to package it nicely, you know, so that it can be in the market. But this grant boosted that, you know, it boosted my kale chips. Even right now, I'm still selling kale chips in the market. They are still going hard, parallel to my second grant, which I did in, 2000, in 2020. I wasn't, you know, the COVID was hitting. Everything was just going to be like, what? And there was a class that Melissa was offering to, and I said, well, I'm gonna go take it. I took my time from everything, everything. I focused and I focused and I focused. I said, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I believe that my past will help me to move forward. And I did that and I got my second grant. Right now, this is through the pandemic. I'm telling you, I don't think if it wasn't of this grant, I would be standing because the price of everything skyrocketed, everything changed. And I have to say, okay, what do I do? I have to play with it, work with my team, work with my leader in the in the WSD. I have to work with them. So, you know, things are going this way. What should I do? They said, okay, you can come up, see how much you can market your products. And I started it because I'm in Pike Place, U District, West Seattle, and we're in Capitol Hill. And I do Bayview yeah. Farmers Market, our local. And then now uh, I'm in a food hub, the island food hub. Get into I put all those beans farming them was so hard too. So I was able to uh, to put them together and uh, put effort in farming, harvesting them. You know, like this year, one problem that I came up with, they didn't ripen in time. Then I had to have all my kids come, we shelled them, hand shelling. And then I said, okay, if we don't dry them, we're gonna do something so that we can sell these beans. So that's what we do. And I tell you, this has helped me a lot. So um, the grant was uh, a big hand 
despite the challenges that we face in the market. But because I had a support, I am able to, to keep going even right now to sustain my business of farming. I, I have to say that Dorcas is absolutely a joy to work with. She was an ideal uh, client to work with. Um, Dorcas, can you tell the other farmers here what it was like to put the application together? Um, was it a lot of work? Well, uh, kind of talk them through what that was like for you. Well, uh, one thing that I can tell you, I when I started, I didn't know how to do budget. <laughs> I didn't know how to do that. And calculations, and then uh, researching to to value my time as a farmer, you know, it was one of those things that I did not know how to do. But because there was a class, these people, Melissa Mola, Jeff Falls, and the other team, they were there to teach us how to do it. And I learned a lot of that. And then it made things easier. After you do your budget, and then you research your products, and you formulate your product, and you've been doing this product probably, you know, farming and things like that, it become easier. It, the second one is not hard, difficult at all. It's the time you put in it. And then learn what they're teaching you and be patient with it. Yeah, for me, the only challenge was creating that budget from the first one. But the second one, no, I stayed with it. And they said, you do this, you do this, you do this. And I follow those steps and it helped me to stay and be able to uh, and simplify things. I made it very simple and I focus on one product and simplify it and simplify where my funds will be focusing on really. And then, you know, packaging and labor. And then the main thing was transportation, you know, deliverance and get the product to those stores was the main thing because those products, they're gonna be pushed to go out there. And I focused on those and it was, yeah, it wasn't really hard, but the challenges was came in during the COVID when I have to sell the products. But other than that package itself, you can do it. So Dorcas, what was it like for you or what has it been like for you working with uh, USDA Rural Development on your reimbursements? Well, to be honest with you, I love these guys. I'm telling you, for, I don't know, I mean, four, five, six years now I've been doing with, and then um, uh, Brandon Hoffman, he is a blessing in, the, in, the, in our region on the side. He is, you know, and the team that he works with at the USG in Mount Vernon, they are really helping people like me, like any women in business, anyone who's really, if you are patient to work with them, they are helpful people, I'm telling you. I really, I will work with them until I don't know what, but they are very good at guiding you, you know, giving you the pathways, helping you. You know, patience, they have that. So Dorcas, how have these grants helped you to make your farm more sustainable? Well, here it is. Right now I had it sustained me through COVID, through COVID. When there was no, um, when, when things shaked in 2020, 2020, 21, I got money in 2020, end of that September, 2021, oh my goodness, it was hard. I don't think when the prices go up, transportation, gas, everything, if I didn't have a grant, I don't think I would have made it. I was able to get into the Seattle markets because I had this grant to support my expenses. So that means getting in there and be able to push for sale, hire people, hire people to do my markets and I can focus on producing products. That was a big uh, push and a big lifting right there. So it has helped me to be where I am right now. I'm looking at, you know, to, to be able to get a farm, the land for myself that I can do this. Without this, I don't think I'll be there. What advice would you have, Dorcas, for other farmers who are thinking about applying for the Value Added Producer Grant? Here is my advice to anyone who is going to do this. 
just put effort in this. It's a competitive, you know, uh, grant. But if you follow the steps that you have been given by the guidance through this class, you will win in the grant and simplify it. Don't don't do too much, you know, maybe big project and no, you just simplify and take one thing and form, form, formulate it and focus on it. That's awesome. And focus and ask as much questions from the people that are helping you to write, to put it together and follow. It's, it's a commitment to take those classes. You have to take it, you have to. Oh, you're muted, Dorcas. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so I'm advising you to just take it. Take a leap in a faith and you'll do it. Awesome. Thank you, Dorcas. Awesome. Well, Thank now you. I'd like, like to introduce Amy Fry from Boldly Grown Farm. Amy, are you here? Emily, can you help me find her and make sure she's unmuted? She was phoning in while they were driving across the mountain pass, so I'm not sure if she made it. Looking, I do not see her, but I'll keep looking. <laughs> um, well, while we wait to see if she's here, does anyone have any questions for Dorcas? Talk to another farmer. Okay. Yeah, Dorcas, um, do you want to tell everyone how much your grants were worth and, and what that kind of a little bit more about it? Yes. My first grant was $50,000 and it was for, um, you know, the expenses that I needed to, to sell my products. So that one was really good because I was able to buy uh, supplies to package my products, you know, in a quality that was uh, appeal, appeal, appealing to customers, you know? Because to be honest, when you make a product, it's not well packaged, you know, it may not sell because packaging is a key for selling products. So I did that. That was the first one, 50,000. And the second one was 250,000, which I got for now, it's for three years. And it's two years, but uh, because of circumstances that happened during the COVID, I was able to extend, to apply to, for extension and I was accepted to do extension on it. So um, I'm gonna be going back right now to, to look for another one so that I can keep going because the situation in the market needs this to support us. So I did that and this grant was mostly for, I get supplies, you know, employing people and then the transportation, I focus on that and my ingredients that I needed to, to, to change the state of the products and processing. So those are the, the, the big areas that I focused on and marketing the product, marketing the product. Yeah, so I, I hope you all heard that she was, you know, grew her farm on her own for a while, and then she applied for and got a $50,000 grant to sell kale chips, which she was very successful in. And then she got a $250,000 grant to sell dried beans. So now she's looking at her next potential application and do that one as soon as this one is done. Um, unlike a lot of private foundation grants or other grants where it's kind of once and done, you know, they, they once you've gotten money, they want to give it to someone else. With this value added producer grant, they like to give money to people who have proven that they can handle that money, that they can execute on a project and complete it. So um, having them back to back, as long as you're coming up with new products and expanding your markets, it's a wonderful way to uh, have the government help you expand your farm. Um, thank you, Dorcas. I don't know that we have Amy. Emily, is she? I just admitted her. Oh, excellent. Amy, are you here? She's connecting to audio. Excellent. Good, good. There she is. Amy? Hello, I'm here. Sorry about that. 
No problem. I, I told everyone you were in the car and um, yeah, we're going over highway too. So, you know, of course it's perfect timing with the uh, no cell phone service. Of course, of course. So, um, so tell everyone, we've got a bunch of farmers in the group as well as other people. Tell them about your project. What value added project did you receive a grant for? Yeah, so we received a VAPG grant this year for $250,000 for radicchio market expansion. So our crop uh, that we picked is radicchio and our value add is organic. So we went for the organic category uh, as opposed to the local um, because we were, were selling kind of outside that radius of what they define as local. So the organic seemed to be uh, better for our purposes. Uh, and we work with Melissa on the application. So that's the gist. And yeah, you can ask more questions and I'll fill in sure. more details. Yeah. So I, I, you know, most people, when they think of value added, they think of uh, drying something, making a jam, you know, changing it that way. But what you did is you're just, you added value by it being organic and you're selling it to more people in more places. So I, I, I hope that people can see from your story that uh, value added is much broader than um, making jams or jellies. Yeah, and I think that was good. I think basically it was probably about last year that we took this workshop. Um, you know, I'd known about this grant for many years, but didn't exactly know the details. And again, kind of probably assumed that it was for those processed products. Um, so yeah, knowing that they define, define value added in different ways was super helpful to realize like, how can we make this work for our operation? Yeah, so what was it like for you putting the application together? Did you do it in a weekend? No, <laughs> um, very <laughs> thorough application process. And this is like, I've written a bunch of grants before, so I'm not new to grant applications and this one definitely was next level. So, um, so I really, for us having your help, Melissa, was essential for us to be able to do this just because of how busy we were. It's the sort of thing where like maybe if I had all the time and, you know, ample time, I could have done it on my own. But having someone who just was familiar with the application form and the whole process um, was definitely helpful. But yeah, definitely allocating enough time to work on it um, is super important. You know, we had to, in addition to figuring out the grant budget and getting quotes and estimates for what we wanted to include in the budget, you know, doing a whole, um, uh, I'm blanking, like the market, market analysis, um, kind of business plan sort of thing that we wrote about Rudikio and, um, yeah, it's, it, it's all doable, um, but it just takes time. I have to confess, I'd never heard of Radicchio before we did this project. So I, I learned a ton and that was super fun. Um, so, so did you find the toolkit that USDA provides to be a helpful tool in that process? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think because we were working with you, I feel like you were kind of our go between in some ways between the toolkit and our actual application, you know, like we collaborated very much together on it um but yeah in general i would say yes so what advice would you have for anyone who's considering applying for a value-added producer grant um definitely again like i said allocate enough time and i know we i can't remember when the announcement was released i feel like we didn't have a ton of time between when it was released and when the application was due so um kind of doing whatever legwork you can ahead of time. Like we were already thinking of what we wanted to apply for um, before it was announced. So like you can start thinking now of like what crop would you wanna do um, and what's your value add? Is it local, is it organic? So kind of whatever pre legwork you can do um, just to think about the, you know what you're gonna do with the funds would be helpful. Um, I definitely recommend working with Melissa or someone who is familiar with the process. Um, I feel like that was definitely a big part of what led us to have a successful application. Um, those are the main things that come to mind. And yeah, I mean, our project just started on October 1st. So it's a two year project. So we're really very, like not very far into it at this point. Um, so I haven't submitted for our first reimbursement yet. I'm working on that soon, but uh, so I feel like I'm a, I don't have much advice to give on that 
front, but um, you can ask me in a month and I probably will know more. So, yeah. Yeah. In terms of the timeline last year, there was only a 60 day window between when they announced that the application was open and when the applications had to be turned in. But um, Amy, remind me when we started um, last year, it opened on March 1st, but we started working on the application in December or January. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause we knew, I mean, we didn't know, you know, things might change a little bit as far as the nitty gritty details, but the basics of the program seem like they don't change significantly from year to year. So yeah, definitely don't wait until the official announcement comes. Like you can start now and start getting all your, yeah, your legwork done. So Joanne asks, how did you use this grant to market your radicchio or, you know, how are you planning to now that you've just started the project? Yeah. So our budget, um, I was even trying to see if I could pull it up to share my screen to give a sense of it. Um, but I don't know if I can do that here on my phone. Um, so we, a lot of our funding was for labor. So again, because the grant funds everything post harvest, so all of the processing and packing. So I, labor is definitely the biggest chunk. Um, so we can process and pack more radicchio. Um, and then, uh, for us, a big part of it is branding and website development. So basically those like general things to promote our business, which will help us drive sales. Um, so we've already gone through now a logo creation process. We didn't have a logo before we're going to be starting work with a web developer on a new website soon. Um, and then we also have money in the grant for, uh, print materials and other advertising. So like creating, um, whatever sort of promotional materials might be helpful for the different stores to sell our radicchio. Um, one of the things we're doing is we, uh, bought a farm last year. And so we're opening a farm stand on site. So that is a completely new marketing channel for us. So, um, the grant obviously can't cover like the bigger infrastructure parts of that, but it can cover again, like labor, for developing and staffing the farm store, as well as some of the stuff to go inside of it, like a point of sale system, I think we, we put in there. And um, yeah, again, like marketing materials and like some tables and stuff to have in the farm stand um, so we can sell radicchio there. Um, and then also in our budget is a bunch of kind of our overhead costs, I would say. Um, things like our organic certification, like the amount that's not covered by um, the uh, organic cost care reimbursement, um, just general, some general overhead costs, like rent, utilities, things like that, that again, if like, if our business was only growing radicchio, we would still have to have those costs covered. So um, those are in there, but yeah, a lot of it, as far as like driving sales of radicchio to new customers, um, it's a lot of those promotional materials as well as like some increased insurance coverage because some of the wholesalers who we've wanted to work with have wanted insurance requirements that were fairly cost prohibitive. So this grant will kind of help us cover those. And then hopefully over the two years, like we can build sales with those customers to the point where then it makes sense for us to be paying those higher insurance costs. It's hard. It's a hard sell to want to pay a level of insurance that like you're not even sure you're going to sell as much product, you know, to cover, cover that cost. But this grant, it just gives a bit of a buffer as we work to increase the markets. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Gabrielle asked, were you already organic? Did you need to change to be organic to get the grant? If you were organic all along, would you qualify? And the answer to all of that is uh, yes. You know, uh, they were already organic and they are adding value to a product. It's not new value that they're adding. They've been adding that value all along, but it is added value over the commodity price of the radicchio by having it be organic. So it doesn't necessarily have to be being new to being organic or new to being free range or new to being local. If you're already doing all of those things, that is adding value. You're already adding value and they want to help you add even more value. Um, yeah. Add, like we were already, we've been selling organic radicchio for years. So it's not that that was even a new crop for us, but it's again, how do we increase our our, I mean, the grant isn't helping us increase our production, but our plan is to increase production. And then the grant can help us make sure we can market that increased production. So like our planned match is fully in our radicchio product at the commodity price. So basically 
we looked at <clears throat> over the course of the grant period, how much radicchio, how many heads of radicchio would we sell? And then multiplied that by the commodity price per head and, um, you know, got to the point where, yeah, we made our $250,000 match. So, you know, and even talking with, like, even though I haven't submitted a reimbursement yet, um, I've been in touch with our, the person at the USDA who's assigned to us. Um, and she seems great and like willing to be super helpful. And it sounds like we may have more flexibility even than I thought we would either to change how some of our match is calculated if we want to include it, like our labor as in-kind labor, um, or if we want to shift funds, like we didn't include funds in our grant budget for say travel. Um, but that's something talking to some of our customers more because we sell mostly wholesale. They think that doing like tasting events in stores might be a big way to say sell more radicchio through grocery stores. So um, it sounds like we might have more flexibility even than I thought we would to switch some funds over to say a travel budget. But um, again, I'll know more about that kind of as we work on making adjustments as we go but yeah yeah that, that's awesome amy I mean, and you're and you're right there is a there's some flexibility it's important to have a really solid budget as you apply and and make your very best guesses on what your expenses will be but usda really understands that farming happens right farming happens it things change you don't necessarily have the same plan uh, that you thought you would two or three years before as you're executing on it any other questions for Amy and Dorcas while we have them here? Well, um, thank you. Oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, Ashe had asked, uh, so you can focus on one raw product and just expand the field production. It doesn't pay for expanding the field production, but as you expand the field production, all of your post-harvest expenses can be covered. Yes, yeah, so if you currently are farming one acre, of carrots and you say I can sell double the number of carrots and you plant another acre in carrots once those carrots are out of the field then the clock starts in terms of what's paid for so washing those carrots putting them into bags the cost of the bags the cost of the labels the website the delivery your ins added insurance like Amy said to get into bigger stores you know that was a pretty big leap for them to be able to get into bigger stores that have a higher insurance requirement all of those things are covered by this grant. And I would just add, because um, I think the question was like, you just, can just pick one product. And I think that was advice we took from you, Melissa. Like we could have picked more, but kind of thinking strategically about if we want to apply for more grants in the future, like we won't be able to apply for organic radicchio again, because we've already done that. So it, you, I think if I recall correctly, your advice was like, pick one product. And then the next time around, you can pick a different product and um, I do think that for us, the, there is definitely a challenge about like, as far as the focus needing to be on new customers, because I, I do wish there was the chance to have increased sales to current customers, like counted, um, because we sell primarily to wholesale. So if we increase our sales to a wholesaler, that's probably because they're selling it to more of their customers. So um, that is like the one thing I would just think about of the focus for the grant is on new customers. So just something to keep uh, aware of. Yeah, yeah uh, Amy's absolutely right. My recommendation is always narrow the fo focus of your grant to the smallest uh, number of types of commodities you can. In her case, it was just radicchio. They grow a lot of other things, but this grant was only for the radicchio so that when she's done spending the money on this grant, she can come back and ask for a grant for carrots and then the next year a grant for kale and whatever all it is that she wants to grow more of and sell more of. Um, the 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 most heartbreaking applications that I've seen that other people have written for this are where they mention every product that they might ever want to do, every variety, every value-added product, all-in-one grant application. And even if they don't execute on that, let's say, you know, uh, they're doing yogurt and they list 
12 flavors of yogurt, even if they only ever in the grant period sold one flavor of yogurt, they now can't come back and ask for an application for any of those kinds of yogurt because they mentioned them or varieties of mushrooms. I worked with someone who, who mentioned every single variety of mushroom that he grew in the application with someone else, except for one. And so we were able to do a second application for that one variety that was missed. But if you can focus it down to one crop, one variety of one crop, you set yourself up for being able to come back and repeatedly ask for more um, VAPG funds in the future. Um, you know, there, there's some nervousness I hear on the chat about working with USDA, and I just want to echo what Marion said as a fellow farmer that this particular group of government employees are here to help you. This is not something where you are giving up rights. You're not gonna have anybody come on your property and do inspections. This program was designed to help the small and medium-sized family farm succeed. This gives um, all of our legislatures an opportunity to brag that they're saving the family farm, that they're creating rural jobs, that they are bringing money back to the farm. Um, it, it, they're, they're here for you and they want to help. They want you to have a successful application. They want this money to come into Washington state. There is a nationwide pool of money. It's not apportioned by states. And then they take every single application that's brought in and they score them. And the highest scored gets get funded and they go down the list until they run out of money for uh, funding. So theoretically, Washington state could have all the money. And I think that would make Carlotta really, really happy as well as it would make all of us happy. Um, yeah, so so I just wanna say they, they are on our side and uh, we're, we're very thankful to have them here. Uh, so now we're gonna move into the application process. So I'll go back to sharing my screen. And uh, we'll definitely have more time for, um, whoops. There we go. Okay, the application process. Okay, so hopefully you've all been thinking about what you want your uh, product to be, what value-added product you want to do if you're a farmer. I hope you understand that every single one of you is probably eligible in some way. There are very few farmers who are producing in Washington who would not be eligible for this application. So the first step, you want to determine the, you, what your value-added project is. What do you already produce? Think about what you're already selling, and I would encourage you to think about doing a market expansion rather than emerging market. With that need for a feasibility study, it can be very cost prohibitive to do that. Plus, if you're already producing something, you know how to do that. You know how to do it well. And uh, think about, can you produce more of it? Do you have the land to produce more of it? Do you have customers who are waiting for it, right? Do you have the ability to sell more of that? And then you're gonna wanna tell that story about how you have successfully been selling and marketing this product for at least two years at the time of application. So as of, let's say, probably April of 2023. So you wanna make sure you're selling it for two years as of that date. And can you sell more of it, right? You're going to want to tell the story about the wait list that you have, that people want your product and they're not able to get it yet because you need to be able to expand. That's going to tell a really great story in the value-added uh, application. Again, uh, narrow the scope of your application to maximize your grant ask. Don't ask for 20 types of vegetables because if you do, then you're never gonna be able to come back and ask to be able to do a market expansion for those 20 types of vegetables. If you can narrow it down to one, like Amy did with the radicchio, or like Dorcas did with first kale, kale chips, and then second with dried beans. Those aren't all the things she grows either, but by being able to focus on that one product at a time, they're able to get maximum funding for that and then come back. Dorcas is getting ready to start applying for her third application. And I'm sure Amy is already thinking about what her second application will be. And then the last step in there on determining your value added product is what value added methodology do you wanna use? There really are three that people tend to use. Um, the first is uh, an irreversible process. 
So if you want to do kale chips, right, you can't ever go back to the raw kale. So that is a change in state. If you want to sell cut up apples in a bag, if you want to make jam jelly pickles, those are all changing the state. In my case, soup stock, I could never take a retired laying hen and turn her back into a laying hen. She is now retired and in the soup pot. So that was a, a irreversible change of state. That's one. The second one that we see a lot is organic, free range, any other enhanced production methods that set you apart from the USDA commodity production methods for that product. If you're already doing that, that's awesome. That would be a great one to choose. But the third category is locally sold, locally um, marketed. If you sell your product within 400 miles of your farm or within the state that you're in, Washington, probably for most of you, um, that is local. You are selling a local product and you are adding value by selling it locally. People in Washington are willing to pay more for Washington grown kale than kale that was grown in California. And so that is added value. So hopefully between those three, um, you, you can find one that fits you. Oh, yeah, here, here they are again. That physical segregation and renewable energy, I've never worked on an application for either of those. It's, it's the change in physical state, enhanced production method, or locally produced food product that I would encourage you to do. Now, you can do um, non-food products. You can do wool. You can do flowers. You can do essential oils but you can't do those under locally produced. The locally produced is the only one that specifies it has to be a food product. So if you want to do, um, and, and this is something that, you know, I have written applications for, but it is a, a hard sell to sell uh, flowers using enhanced production methods. There has to be something very specific about your production methods that set it apart from all the other flowers grown in the country. Um, a change in physical state, definitely, if you want to sell dried flowers, if you want to sell wool, if you want to sell yarn, that is a change in physical state from the uh, fleece that was produced by the sheep. Okay, oh, I guess I go through all this in my slide. So here's that change in physical state again, an irreversible process, the enhanced production methods, and the locally produced. Okay, so the next step, understand your current numbers. So in order to fill out the market expansion application or the simplified uh, working capital application, well, I guess even the emerging market, you're gonna need to understand your numbers. Um, how much have you produced in the last three years? If you worked with me, that would be the first, these would be the first questions I would ask you. Tell me how much you have sold of your kale chips in the last three years, if we're doing the market expansion. So we're going to look at the, the uh, last three years. How much more can you produce in the next three years? So if we're going to write a two-year application, which is what I tend to encourage people to do as a 24-month application, um, we want to have projections for the next three years. So um, because it, it, it goes through the time where you're receiving the grant money and beyond, because we want to show that by having this infusion of extra cash from USDA, you're going to be able to be sustainable in your project after those funds are gone. So, you know, do, do some analysis on your land. How many more acres could you plant? How many more heads could you buy? How, you know, wh what more can you produce and grow? You're going to need to show growth. You can't just say, well, I've maxed out my land. I'm going to continue to produce the same amount. It's totally okay to farm that way. Absolutely. If that's where you're at, that's wonderful. But that is not what this grant program is going to fund. It wants to fund growth. It wants to fund uh, new products or a market expansion of current products. So we're also gonna look at what have your sales been for the last three years? Are you growing in your sales? Or 2020 is gonna be an odd number. Unfortunately, our applications right now are gonna show some strange things happening because of COVID and that's okay and that's to be expected. You don't have to show linear growth. I don't think anyone did because of COVID. They either had big spikes of increase and then settled back down in 2022 or they had uh, low sales in 2020 because of not being able to get to their markets. Regardless, we're gonna wanna show 
that you have a sales history it doesn't have to be three years because it only has to be two years, but it is nice if you have been selling for longer to show that. And then what and, do you um, I also want to understand what do you want your, um, what do you anticipate your growth can be in the future, right? Do you have customers who are waiting and you can show, yes, I, I'm going to continue to sell. I'm going to have a lot more product to sell. And here's what I anticipate my revenue to be into the future. Um, and then on your current customers, who are your main current customers and who would buy from you if you had more to sell? Do you have a wait list? If you don't have a wait list, who is on your wish list of uh grocery stores that you want to sell to or farmers markets that you'd like to enter or even um, individual restaurants that you'd like to sell to. You want to figure out who those are and we're going to tell your story in the application with all of those numbers. Okay. Fourth step, maybe this probably even has been the first step, but you know, we're, we're here in the application now and you want to make sure that you are operating completely above board. I, I I know farming. I know farming is, there's a lot of things that happen that um, may not be completely on the up and up, you know, people paying people under the table. When you're working with the federal government, you want to get those ducks in a row first. You're wanting to grow from, you know, a hobby farm to a legitimate business that can support your family. So you want to make sure that you have all your appropriate business licenses. Um, state of Washington is actually pretty easy and generous in terms of what is expected of farmers. Um, but you do want to make sure that you understand what that is and that you are operating with proper licensing. You want to employ everyone legally. I, I can't tell you the number of times I have talked to people who are paying under the table. And while it feels like a simple, easy solution at the time, you are putting yourself at, at pretty big risk um, if something were to ever happen. I, I have stories I can tell at another time about um, accidents that we had on our farm that um, if we hadn't have been employing people legally would have been really detrimental to my family. Um, so employ people legally, especially if you want to be reimbursed for their labor in this grant. Uh, next question, are you either a US citizen or reside in the US after legal admittance? If you can't answer yes to that, please do not apply for this grant. <laughs> we, uh, uh, yeah, let's just leave it at that. Do you have the authority to act on behalf of your organization? I think it's going to be a pretty easy yes for most of you, but I did have one application that was in the middle of a, 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 the father had died and the siblings weren't agreeing on how to move forward with the ranch. And so in the end, the application was denied because they didn't have the legal authority to act on behalf of the organization. So just make sure that's true before you continue. You will be asked if you're current on your IRS tax filings. So if you are delinquent or have any IRS judgments against you, please get those cleared up before you apply for this, um, this program. But again, look at that list. There's nothing that says you're giving them permission to come on your land. You're not giving up any rights to your land. You're not giving up any rights to how you farm, where you farm, what you're going to do with your farm. Um, it, this truly is something that is is for you. There have been other government programs that my husband and I as farmers chose not to do because we didn't want to give up certain rights that we had to sign certain rights away. That's not true with this program. Okay. A business or marketing plan. So do you have a current business plan? Um, you don't have to in order to apply for this, but it sure is helpful. The language that you have in your business plan is a wonderful place to cut and paste for your marketing materials for this grant, for other grants, for other loans. I created a business plan when I was in the uh, Sustainable Connection program many years ago and I continued to use it until the very end when we sold the farm. I am able to cut and paste different language about who we are and what we want to do. Um, do you have a marketing plan for your value-added product? If you don't, going through the toolkit, uh, basically you will end up with one anyway. So you might as well take those pieces of information and put them into a written marketing plan. It doesn't have to be 50 pages. Honestly, it could be five, five pages, six pages, just answering certain questions about what your sales have been, what you would like them to be in the future, 
who your customers have been, who you would like them to be in the future, um, and, and what's special about your project. So uh, I would say if you don't have one, go ahead and start working on a marketing plan now for a value-added product. Um, even if you don't apply, I have had people who, who go through that process and say, I, I don't really want to apply for it now, but having that marketing plan in place has been invaluable for helping me focus my time and energy on my business and helping it to grow and become a more sustainable farm. And if this is a new product, an emerging market, do you have a feasibility study that has been produced by a qualified professional? And I really appreciate Carlotta's answer to that question. Um, the USDA does not have a list of qualified professionals. They don't even necessarily have criteria on what makes somebody a qualified professional. The key thing here is that um, you are paying the money so you do want it to be somebody who is qualified. You cannot produce it yourself, um, even if you are, you know, somebody who does that for a living. I, I couldn't do it for myself, for my own farm, if I wanted to do a feasibility study. It has to be somebody outside of you. And, it, and you know, you're going to want that. You're going to want to show, is this brand new product that I want to do this, uh, you know, want to start making hard cider. Do you have what it takes in order to be able to do that? And if not, Great to know it now before you go buy a bunch of equipment and, and get started going down the road with that. Okay. Uh, simplified applications don't require a business marketing plan or a feasibility study. However, uh, like Carlotta said, you might as well have at least the marketing plan because all of the pieces from the marketing plan you have to answer in the application toolkit. Uh, market expansions don't require a feasibility study like the um, emerging market does. So that is where I tend to encourage people to think of rather than the new idea of something you have like beef jerky. Let's first do a market expansion of your beef cuts. And then while you're drawing on your uh, VAPG funds for that for the next two years, go ahead and start making your jerky not under VAPG funds, do that separately, start selling it so that by the time you're done with your current VAPG for the beef cuts, you'll be ready for your next VAPG application for a market expansion of your, um, what did I just say? Was it teriyaki? <laughs> I forgot my own example, <laughs> but you get the point. Beef jerky. Beef jerky. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So next step. Begin working on your application. If you are at all interested in applying for 2023, start now. Um, I guess that link doesn't show you where it is, but we will send out the link after this. Um, they're not accepting applications now. Don't turn it in. Don't, you know, don't try and do that yet, but use last year's toolkit and start filling it out um, so that when they make the announcement, and like I said earlier, we had one year where it was December 18th and caught everybody by surprise, including the local rural development office right before Christmas. Last year, it, the application didn't open until March 1st with a May 1st deadline. It doesn't change that much year to year. I have never seen it change dramatically. There um, have been small things in terms of who gets priority points, which is, you know, really just a checkbox on the application, how they handle hemp. They added that in recently. They didn't have that as an eligible activity before or an eligible project. Um, and uh, during uh, uh, the last two years, there was COVID money. So rather than have to have a one-to-one -one match, meaning you put in $250,000 to get their $250,000, they had a one-to-ten match option where you could put in $25,000 of commodity or your time or your cash and get the $250,000. Um, but you know those are minor changes from how it's been year to year. And since my first application that I did in 2011, I could probably go back and take that 2011 toolkit and still have an application that's 95% ready when the 2023 one comes out. So I would say if you're interested, we will send you a link to the toolkit where you can find it and go ahead and look through that and start filling it out. Start filling it out now. Okay, so what are you going to need in order to complete that application? The very first thing that you should get even if you don't want to do a VAPG, 
go get a UEI. This is Universal Entity Identifier through um, the U.S. Uh, to the federal government, this is what will allow you to receive federal money. If you are not registered in that system, you cannot receive grant money through the federal government. The process for getting this UEI has, is a little challenging, um, not in terms of what the information you need to provide, but they, they changed the whole system this last year and introduced a lot of little gotchas. So I would say if there's a remote chance that you want to apply for the VAPG this week, if you do just one thing, go apply for the UEI. It can take four to eight weeks to get it done, um, just in terms of the waiting process. So I'm going to show you here in a little bit where to do that. Have a project budget. You're going to need to know what you're going to spend that $250,000 on. Um, I, and again, I keep using the $250,000 because I really encourage people to go for the max. Either go for the $50,000 with the simplified, don't go for $25 or $30, go for $50. Or go for the whole $250,000 and have a, a marketing plan that goes with that. Um, it's pretty amazing how quickly you can spend that money when you start adding up what your current expenses are, what all the pieces are that touch your, your value-added product. Um, like Amy said, she needed more insurance. She needs a new website that's enhanced and really uh, showcases the radicchio, right? She's got farmer's market expenses. She has uh, not just the farmer market fees, but she also has um, the, the materials she needs to sell, right? Your tables, your coolers, your banners, your posters, your pictures, your brochures to hand out. All of those things are eligible expenses. Uh, projections, you want to be able to show how much of that value-added product you're going to be able to produce, how many pounds, bushels, barrels, you know, how, however you measure it, you're going to be, I need to be able to show how much you're going to produce each year of your project, whether it's a one-year, two-year, or a three-year project. You're going to need to show how much you think you can sell. You, um, you're going to be able to need to show who you're going to sell that product to. And these need to be new customers. Um, you can't just sell to the same people that you've been selling to um, to access this money. You really want to show that you are reaching new customers, more customers in new places. You're going to need letters of support. Um, I, I apologize, I don't think that one slide was very clear that I had put together that Carlotta showed earlier. You're going to need letters of support. You're going to write one yourself. You need letters of support from customers. So I encourage people to get one to three letters from existing customers, one to three letters from new customers, people who you want to buy from you. If they're willing to commit and say, absolutely, we are going to buy from you for sure, that's awesome. If they can't say that, at least have them say they'd be willing to look at your product if you had it available. If they can't even say that, have that grocery store manager say they think it's a good idea for you to be producing more of that product. So whatever level of commitment you can get from them, get a letter of support for that. You're also going to need letters of support from any, um, any group or organization that's key to your success. So if you're going to join the Puget Sound Food Hub, it'd be really great if you asked for a letter from the Puget Sound Food Hub as a support letter um, or a farmer's market manager that you are currently in or want to be in or uh, your website designer or if uh, you work with a bookkeeper and have them write a letter of support for you showing that you know, you are an ongoing concern and that uh, uh, you're basically wanting to show that people in the community uh, know who you are and agree that you have what it takes in order to do this and that they are there to support you. And ABC is another great reference for that. Okay, a uh, business or marketing plan, you don't have to for the simplified application, but again, all the pieces that would go into a marketing plan are going to go into the application. So you might as well you know, whether you do the application first and then create a marketing plan from that or start where you should with a marketing plan and then cut and paste that into the application. Either way, you're producing the same information. You might as well put it into a marketing plan with a great picture of your farm on the cover. 
you're going to need to uh, show verification that your business is in good standing. So if you are an LLC, you'll go to the Secretary of State's website and pr um, print out a letter of, of good standing as well as, as your articles of incorporation. Um, if you're a, a, a sole proprietor, you would use your Schedule F to show that you are in good standing. And you're going to need to be able to show verification of your in-kind match. So the first thing I would encourage you to do is start with your commodity. How many pounds can you produce of that commodity in the um, in, in the uh, in the two year period that you have you're asking for for your grant? You have your price that you're selling it for, but that's not the price that you're going to use for your in kind match. You're going to use a commodity pricing. So if it's a vegetable, I would say go to the Agricultural Marketing Service website and start there. They have really good information on how much, if you were to just sell 10,000 pounds out into the general market, that's what uh, the value of it would be. Use that for your in kind match. That info, that website is not very good for proteins or for non-food products. Um, so I would say you would need to come up with in-kind match for your commodity other ways. So for my eggs, what I did was I went to the grocery store and I said, well, what do non-organic eggs sell for retail? But then I can back out what the retail price is to the wholesale price because I know what the markup is for me when I'm selling in the store. So I came up with a... Uh, commodity price for my eggs, I think I ended up at $1.99. I just took a, a survey. Here's three brands of eggs. I did a market survey in my local Hagen on this date. I averaged them. It came out to $1.99. So that is what my in-kind match value was for my eggs. I went out and I sold them for $7.25 a dozen in the wholesale market, but I was able to take that $1.99 as part of my $250,000 match. So I would, at the end of the month, say, here's how many dozens of eggs I produced. You don't necessarily even have to have sold them, but how many did you produce? And this is what their value is. So that is my $10,000 match in eggs to uh, then get reimbursed for $10,000 of other expenses. So start with your commodity. If you can't get to the full amount with your commodity, use family labor. So that's anyone who is related to you who is working on the farm and you value that time based on what uh, someone else would be paid to do that same labor. If you can't meet your match in that, then you can go to contributing cash or uh, a loan that's backed with the, um, the grant or a rich uncle or somebody who's willing to say, do your website for 50% off. They're like, you know, I really believe in your business. And while I would normally charge $10,000 for this, I will do it for you for 5,000. And they would provide a letter saying that they're contributing that other $5,000 as part of your match. Okay. Okay. So back to that unique entity identifier. Um, to get a unique entity identifier, go to www.sam.gov. Don't go anywhere else. Don't do a Google search on it. There are lots and lots of people who will gladly take your money to go sign you up in SAM. SAM is always free. Anybody who ever wants you to give them money to do any interaction with SAM.gov is trying to rip you off. So don't let that happen. Go to www.sam.gov and uh, go through the get started process. It's going to have you... Put in your information, your name, address, um, your business, and then have, have, have you do some verification that you are really who you say you are and that you are properly licensed. Um, when you go there, the um, first thing to do would be to do get started. And then the next thing that's really important is to check that first box. You want to register for financial assistance awards only. Don't register for all awards. That's for people who are bidding on government contracts. Um, probably doesn't apply to anyone here and is much more challenging to get through. And you also do not want to do the third option, which is get a unique entity ID only. Um, that will not allow you to apply for the VAPG. So I've walked several people through this who, who picked the wrong one and got into lots of trouble with it. So I would say, 
pick that that top one and just make it easier on yourself. For some people, it's super easy and is done in a couple hours. For other people, it can take four to eight weeks. So I would say definitely get started on that right away. Okay, so the application window, as you can see here, it is not open. This is the website to go to. We will send you a link. It's basically ruraldevelopmentusda.gov. And you can even just do a Google search for um, Rural Development Value Added Producer Grant. So this is where I watch on a very regular basis for when these applications are going to be open. And when they're open, we will make sure that you all hear about it. Um, Emily will send you all an email excitedly right away. There have been times literally where I've like stayed up at night. And it's like, okay, it's midnight. Maybe it's going to be opening today. <laughs> I don't know why, but a little bit geeky that way. So uh, this last year, it closed May 2nd. Um, you can apply electronically, but most people, I think, do it by paper. It is a little bit easier process. Anyway, this is the website where you would find that. We will send you a link. Um, okay, in order to apply, so this is that same page, just uh, clicking on the to apply tab. Uh, it's going to talk about your need to register in SAM.gov. And there's a link here for it. If you forget where to find it, always go here to the official one, click on that, or just go to SAM.gov. Down at the bottom of the screen here, you see the two toolkits. There's the applica uh, application planning toolkit and the working capital toolkit. Very few people should be filling out a planning application. You have to go through all of the things as an independent producer anyway. That that one um, that application is really best suited for organizations that want to plan out a project and then um, in the future do a working capital application. But I would say most people go straight to the working capital application. You can click on that little DOCX to open a Word document right into last year's um, application toolkit. Okay, I thought I had a screen on that, but I don't. That's okay. So some reminders, the Value Added Producer Grant is not a technical assistance program. It's not a job training program. It's not intended to teach you how to farm. It's not intended as a continuous stream of capital. And it is not uh, for purchasing equipment or real estate improvements. It is designed to help agricultural producers process, market, and sell their value-added products. It's designed to help them expand their markets and strengthen rural economies. This really is, it's for the family farm. This is to get money directly to farmers in whatever ways we can that help them with every expense that is not a part of production. So you kind of want to draw a line in the sand. It's harvested, it's out of the field, it's butchered, it's off you know, the carcass, now every dime counts toward uh, this. This is where Congress critters get to stand up and say that they are saving the family farm. They are bringing more money back to the farm, back to rural economies. That is what this grant is here for. And again, I know you can't buy equipment with it and everybody wants to, but spend the money on the eligible expenses on the things that this grant wants to fund and then when you get reimbursed, you now have that money for whatever activity you want, whether it's farming or going to Hawaii. It is your money. Build a barn, buy a tractor with the money that you're reimbursed. Don't try and, and uh, submit that as a um, reimbursement request. Okay, now we're back to another question time. So I have not been looking at the chat at all. So I will uh, depend on Emily to help us with that. All right. Well, I will read through. Um, there were a lot, so uh, bear with me. <laughs> so um, Marion had asked, are expenses related to product development, market research, taste testing, better process control, uh, et cetera, covered? Okay, let's go through those one at a time. Tell me the first one again. Market research. You really need to know your market first before a market expansion. And then- Okay, and then taste it, testing. Yes, taste testing would definitely, that would be a, a way that you would be acquiring customers and they love to fund that. Definitely put that in your budget if that is something you wanna do. Include 
the labor, whether you're paying people, right? That can be an eligible reimbursable expense, or if you're the one doing it, that can be your in-kind. And then um, all of your materials, your tables, your tablecloth, everything that you need in order to do that taste testing is an eligible expense. And then better process control, school, et cetera. Uh, better process control, I, I don't know about that, probably not. Can I um, can I just chime in in person? I yeah. I guess I'm looking and and maybe this is part of the the very first grant rather than the other grant. But I'm basically I'm interested in helping you know the value added food producers to to get to the market, and so um, all the work that goes into making sure that a specialty food product is is going to be popular and tastes well so so anything it it is pre-sales work it's while you're trying any cost while you're trying to refine your product so you get it to the point where it's the best possible product and the better process control school is actually something that you need to pay for to do acidified types of foods to okay. get a license. I understand that now. Yeah, you would need to do that first for a market expansion. That could be an expense in an emerging market application. Okay, so it could be for emerging, right? Because it, it would be a new new product that a farmer has not done before. So they would need to go through all of these hoops. I would, I would just add here that the way you described it, I'm thinking it would not be an eligible cost even for emerging because you really are, um, it may be emerging, but it's already being done. So some of those, I uh, maybe not go so far as to call what you said research and development, but it kind of is. And so I'm going to say those, those would not be eligible. However, if you're really wanting to fine tune, we can, you know, get together and, and make sure we're giving you the exact answer. But I'm leaning towards what you described as a no. Okay. I'll contact you separately. It would be possibly under planning, but not um, for working capital. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carlotta. Carlotta is one of the graders. So we are going to go with her answer on any question. <laughs> um. Okay, and then so Joanne had wondered, uh, she has a seed farm, and she's interested in using the grant funds to develop a more professional brand and marketing and, and materials for doing that. And so she can get into larger stores and reach a broader market. Is that an eligible expense? Yes, if she is expanding her market, she would need to be showing that she's going to be producing more, selling more, reaching new customers. Okay, and then we're, we'll get into the uh, clarification questions. Um, Warren early on had asked, um, he wanted some follow-up with the 50% ingredient rule. So um, maybe if you wanna just go into a little more depth on that, um, that would be great. One of my favorite examples is what Brandon used to do of um, somebody who grows basil and they want to start selling pizzas. Absolutely. All of the ingredients that go into making that pizza would be an eligible expense with the basil being the commodity match. Now you'd have to have an awful lot of basil to be able to you know, make an application like that work. But if the only ingredient you were growing was the basil that's part of your margarita pizza, all of the other ingredients are eligible expenses. Does that help? Or, 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 or do you, or, or, no, he was talking about the 50%. I'm sorry, I, I didn't answer that right. So with the 50% rule, you need to grow 50.5 or 51% of the carrots and you can buy 49% of the carrots that you are now going to market and expand into the market. And the carrots that you're buying from your neighbor farm, that 49% of the, of the carrots used in the project is an eligible expense. Did I answer okay. that? Great. If Warren has any more questions, feel free to pop pop it in the chat or chime in. Um, but I will move along. So Gabrielle Hall had asked. Um, she she was confused about the cash match. If it's one one match, would I just be getting the same amount of cash back? Um, she doesn't understand why you would not have just lowered the grant request amount. 
Okay. So if you're going to ask for, let's say, $250,000, you need to contribute $250,000 to the project. So for every dollar that USDA spends, you need to spend a dollar either in the value of your commodity, the value of your labor, cash, loan, or a few other ways. Okay. So let's say in the month of November, um, I spend $10,000 on egg cartons, labor to process eggs, labor to deliver eggs, um, marketing expenses, website, insurance, bookkeeper, et cetera. I have spent $10,000 worth of uh, things that I have receipts for. And now I'm going to take $10,000 of my eggs, time, or cash and match it to that $10,000 request. And USD will write me a check for $10,000. So you, it, it wouldn't help to lower your match, lower your grant ask. You still have to produce 50% of the project cost yourself. You have to contribute that and then they will contribute 50%. Okay, great. Um, Does that answer the question? I will... Gabrielle, does that, if not, you cannot. No, she said no, it doesn't answer the question. Okay, let, let's have Gabrielle unmute and ask in person. Um, I'm wondering, then why wouldn't you just ask for that cash amount less? Like, why would you, why, if, why wouldn't, if you don't have enough money to match with your labor and your raw material, then why wouldn't you just ask, have a lower ask? Like, is there any advantage to contributing cash. It doesn't seem to make sense to me that there is. Gabrielle, maybe it will help you to consider if you're talking about, let's say you're talking about a three-year project that's going to cost 500,000, no matter um, who get, you know, how you're paying it, or if you're doing in-kind or using commodity, all those things and it, whether it's cash or not, the whole thing for uh, three years, you figure will be 500,000 and that's getting it all to market, all to sale, and you're gonna get all your new customers and all the things that need to be done, 500,000. So you still only get, based on our 50% um, match, you're only gonna get 50% of it in grant funds and you show the other 250,000 in those matching categories. Maybe that helps to understand it, I, I think, yeah, Gabrielle, if you think about what your current expenses are, what does it take per year to produce that product? You're still going to have those expenses, whether you get this grant or not, right? I still had to pay for labels and egg cartons and the people who stand there and wash the eggs and deliver them. So I know I already have those expenses. If I can uh, do an application where I get USDA to pay for half of those expenses, then that's in my best interest. But you're right. There may be a situation where you say, I can't really stretch it that far um, in, in, unless I contribute cash and I don't want to contribute cash. You don't have to apply for the whole 250,000. You can apply for any number under 250,000. I'll follow up with you later because I still don't quite understand. I, I do. I get the fundamentals of it. I don't understand this cash piece of it, but I, I, I get I understand the gist of it and I'll touch base with you later. Okay. All right. And then Gabe, Gabrielle had also asked um, she she wanted confirmation that we can essentially do the same project that was previously funded, but under a different category. Um, using the example of eggs, you could get a grant for organic production and then later get a grant for local eggs. I'm going to have Carlotta answer that one. Okay, I think what we I would like to do is follow up on this because there has been confusion, I know, even last year. And um, I want to make sure that we get that clear, um, whether it's new markets and new category or whatever. So we, we really want to clarify that um you know after this when we when we follow up with the written materials if that's all right that's great um 
then Larry wanted to know what the typical elements of a feasibility study for a VAPG would include. So who your market is, who you uh, can sell to, the likelihood that you'll be able to get them to buy your product. Um, you're gonna look at, um, I guess I don't have all the elements in my head, but other elements would include things like your location analysis is your, you know, analyzing the traffic in front of uh, locations that you're selling in and uh, your land, you know, analyzing your land, can your land support the growth that you're wanting to do? So you're just taking all the different pieces and obviously a qualified professional would guide you through all of that. The feasibilities I've seen, studies I've seen have been very comprehensive. 50, 100 pages on analyzing every aspect of your business and whether what you're wanting to do, you have the capacity to do that. And, and the funding, you know, let's say you need equipment, say you want to get into hard cider, how are you going to pay for all of that equipment before you um, get here, right? You're, you're going to want to show that you have everything that it takes to make that a successful project. We do have uh, like a simplified outline and a very detailed outline that was um, produced by USDA in our cooperative program. So I'm willing to share that if anybody asks for those outlines. Yes, I think that would be wonderful to send out with the follow-up resource packet, Carlotta. I will make a note of that. Um, and then Lindsay wanted to know, Lindsay dehydrates culinary herbs that she grows and she's looking to get a VAPG fund or a VAP, VAPG grant to enhance labels for marketing the products locally. Should they get the value of the commodity for dried herbs or commodity fresh herbs in that fresh instance? Fresh herbs. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And then Grayson had a couple quick questions. Grayson wanted to know if we could share out a template for a marketing plan. Um, and I said I'd try to find one and share it out, but I figured I'd ask here too to see if you had any resources off the top of your head. I, I do have a template for a marketing plan uh, that was designed specifically for the VAPG that okay. gathers the information that you need for the application and I can share that. Wonderful. And Grayson also wanted to know if an eligible expense was the time and labor, labor involved in writing the VAPG grant. Nope, not at all, not okay. at all. And Janine wanted to know um, if you get a grant, do you submit the reimbursement monthly or annually? Up to once a month. You don't have to do it every month. Um, for me, it was whenever the dollar value increased to the uh, willingness to endure the pain point of putting together the reimbursement request and putting all those receipts together and making the spreadsheet, um, but they don't want you to do it more than once a month. But don't wait too long because it can be a real mess going through, you know, tons of receipts and and uh, uh, logs of hours and all that. So um, the key is do your first one, you know, pretty soon into it and sort of get a feel for it. And then you'll probably need help and we're willing to give it and um, even into the second one. And then it, it will be a lot easier. So don't let a lot of time pass uh, for the first one and in between. Okay, great. And then Maxime asked if there are other USDA grant programs for purchasing equipment. So um, uh, we have not for grants for equipment, at least at rural development, but we do have some um, revolving loan fund programs uh, specifically uh, for that can be used by farmers for equipment for micro loans under 50,000. Um, and there's probably some requirements to the rural area on that. Um, but if you want to inquire about the um, in revolving loan fund program for that, uh, for that, you know, get a hold of me and I can get you that information and the intermediary lenders that are involved.
Okay, great. I think that's everything from the chat. If I missed something, um, please feel free to reach out. There was a lot happening in that chat. <laughs> um, but I believe I grabbed everything. So I would just open it up to anyone who wants to ask um, in person now and or if you want to raise your hand, however you want to do it. Uh, it's Marion again. Uh, I just uh, put something in the chat about a uh, food business licensing workshop that I've been teaching uh, for about three years now uh, through my work with Goosefoot on Whidbey Island. It's um, It covers the Washington, uh, the WSDA cottage food business licensing, and then also food processors licensing as well. And um, so I put the link to a recorded webinar that's available in there. And also email me if you'd like to get on a mailing list because I, I do teach it about four times a year in person and via Zoom. Thanks. That would be great. Thanks. Okay, great. And Joanne asked, how competitive is the grant? Highly competitive, highly competitive. This is a nationwide uh, competition. And so the better application you write, the more likely you are to be funded. Like I said earlier, it's not a portion per state. It's a portion through the entire nation. And they start at the top with the highest uh, scoring points and move their way down. So while it's highly competitive, it's uh, you also, if you write a really good application, you have a fairly decent chance of being funded. And year to year, it depends on, you know, the uh, the um, number of applications to the amount of funding that's uh, put forth. So like uh, Melissa said, start at the top. And when the money runs out, that then would be the, the scoring, you know, cutoff is just by going through all of them. So one year, maybe the cutoff might be, you know, 75 points. Uh, maybe if it's a real competitive year, it might be a higher number for the, the total score. So it's uh, hard to answer, but it's always competitive. Yes. I'm also going to put the post workshop survey link in the chat. I will also send it out. Um, if you would like to schedule a time with Melissa, to have a one-on-one -on -one half an hour consultation. Um, part of the post evaluation includes some open windows in the next couple of weeks. So that's in the chat now. Yeah, so if anyone's interested in applying for a value added producer grant and would like to have NABC's help with it, that would be the first step, would be filling out that evaluation form and then um, letting me know what time you would, would work for you for us to have a half hour conversation where we talk about your project, your plan, your goals, and then uh, just assess what kind of help you would need. I write a certain number of applications every year. I do have to cut it off so that I don't get overwhelmed and uh, not able to help finish. This is something that you can write yourself. Um, it, I have a lot of experience writing it and I love to work with people and help them write their applications. So I am available for uh, a certain number of slots for that. And if, if my schedule gets full, I can help you find someone else who might be able to work with you if you want the help with it. Um, i trying to remember if there's anything else. Do it, just do it. This is such an amazing program. It's like, every time I talk to a farmer, I say, you really need to do this. I know that as farmers, we are notoriously independent people who do not want to have help, but this is a program that's designed to give you that leg up to help you move to the next level. You know, th there's always a lot of concern and complaints about um, big businesses being benefited. Well, this is for the small family farm. This is for the small business. And it's not any government officials putting you into a database and, and looking over your shoulder. They want you to farm. They want you to farm the way you want to farm and they want to help you with it. Um, I, I'm just a huge fan of this program. If you can't tell, I, I, I absolutely love it. Um, 
did want to put up my contact information there. That's how to contact me directly. But if you do, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation, fill out that uh, evaluation that Emily will send out. We'll also, she in the same email will send out uh, the links that we've talked about here. She'll help me remember what they all are, all the links and documents that we said we would share. And I also want to thank the partners who have helped make this uh, possible, who provide funding, particularly the Office of Partnerships and Public Engagement at USDA, um, who have funded this today. And um, thank you all for being here. It was wonderful to hear your questions. Um, and I look forward to any other conversations people want to have. In the interest of time, we will go ahead and end the recording now. Um, but I will stick around for a little while if anyone wants to chat here publicly further. And thank you so much, Emily and Melissa and NABC as a whole. Thanks so much. And thank you, Carla. I appreciate you being here. That's uh, wonderful that you make yourself available for this. And again, I love working with rural development. I was, as a farmer, a little nervous at first with sharing my information with somebody from government, but rural development is a division that is here for us as farmers. And I just wanted to add, it looks like I had sent the form to Melissa and it worked, but for some reason it says it's no longer accepting responses. I will make sure to get that fixed and send out a working form uh, in the next couple of days before the end of the week for sure. So apologies about that, I'm not sure why that's happening and I will make sure to get you one that works soon. Thank you to everyone. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Dorcas, for presenting. I appreciate that. Thank you. I Thank fixed it. All. <laughs> so it works. Oh, sorry. <laughs>Okay, those of you who are still here, did you want to chat for a bit? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your guys' uh, support here. It means a lot to, you know, um, small farmers, um, especially those who are diving into the farm industry, like myself. Um, it's my third year farming. Um, and I believe, you know, I have a lot to share in terms of preserving our land and providing nutrient dense um, ingredients to our community. And uh, I'm actually really um, excited, Melissa, to work directly with you on this because grants, you know, while I think, you know, um, having some business acumen is good, but grant writing is a whole different scenario. Um, and so, hearing from people and getting coached from people who have direct hands-on experience is super valuable. So I, we really appreciate your support here as a farmer, which is, you know, in my opinion, very unusual. Um, and we're, we're really grateful for that. So thank you so much. Um, I will be filling this form out right now. So hopefully I get on your list. Excellent. I look forward to chatting with you. Cool. Thank you.
Okay, Emily, I think we are probably done. Oh, you're muted. Oh, I, th I think so. Unfortunately, on the interest of wanting to keep it anonymous, I didn't think to ask for emails, but two people have responded already and I didn't get emails. So I, I'll reach out to everyone and say, if you were the first to apply that day, try again, because I, I don't have any way of knowing who you are, unfortunately. Yeah, so if you can get that four revised, because it is, be it's I just went in and fixed it because I I was like, oh, I don't want to put group, I don't want if they're evaluating the course, I don't want to make them identify themselves. But of course, then we're also scheduling time. So yes, yeah, are you're just gonna have to identify yourself. So if anyone on here had already, uh, please. Oh, okay. It looks like yeah, we've got an email. So yeah, okay, good. okay yeah, great. So. You're right. Well, they almost should have been two separate documents, the anonymous evaluation and then the request for a time. And I didn't even think about that. Right. Well, you know, this was my first rodeo. So next time we'll do it that way. And I feel like it, considering it still went pretty well. Excellent. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Melissa. Have a great day. Okay. Oh, nice. Bye. You're welcome. Have a good day, everyone.